sermon series for the next uh, six or seven weeks or so up until Easter is going to focus on the passion of Jesus Christ. We're going to focus on uh, the specific events leading up to the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Today we're starting with the supper that Jesus had with his disciples mere hours before he was betrayed and went to the cross. So would you pray with me before we read our scripture this morning? Lord Jesus, this season of the year in particular, we focus on and we celebrate and remember your passion, your suffering, the way that you voluntarily gave of your life, not just for us, but to us, so that we may find our life in you. Lord, as we read this scripture, would you use it to shape us more and more into your image? We pray this together in Christ's name. Amen. Once again, I've made the rare mistake of leaving the correct version of my scripture in my office. So I'm going to be reading with you off of the screen. No pressure, Deb. Uh, But we're reading today from, uh, from Luke chapter 22. This is the supper that Jesus had with his disciples. Luke tells us that when the hour came, Jesus reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another which of them it could be who was going to do this. Again, this is the word of the Lord. The other day I was walking through a store and I saw a very nice wall decoration that could go in a dining room or a kitchen. And it said, the family that eats together stays together. And as I looked at it, I thought, not only is this a very nice-looking decoration, but it also happens to be entirely true. Family that eats together has a much higher likelihood of staying together. Because a shared meal creates community and it strengthens relationships. A shared meal creates community and it strengthens relationships. There's a reason that it's highly recommended that families do, in fact, spend at least one evening a week or one meal a week just together around the table. No phones, no iPads, no computers, no TV, none of that. Just sharing a meal together. Because families who do report being healthier, happier, stronger, knowing each other better, loving each other more, there's a real measurable benefit to having a shared meal together. There's a reason that a couple that goes out on a date is probably going to have a shared meal at some point in that date or in most of their dates because a shared meal, again, creates community and it strengthens relationships. When we share meals together, it it, it binds us together. I mean, after all, eating is one of the, the most basic things that we have to do as human beings. It's not just a social event, it's a survival event. We have to eat food to survive, and when we share that precious resource with other people, it's a way of saying, the people with whom I am eating, we're in the same tribe, and we're on the same team. I trust these people with a resource that I depend on for my life. Most of this is subconscious, but it's real. This is what goes through our hearts and through our, our souls as we eat together. We are, we are part of the same team, part of the same tribe, part of the same community. Eating together is almost primal in the way that it creates community and strengthens our relationships. 
Well, over the course of his three or so year ministry, Jesus had a lot of meals with his disciples, but on this particular night that we read about just a moment ago in Luke's gospel, Jesus chose to share with them a very specific and very significant meal, the Passover. Many of you will remember that the Passover was, and still is today for the Jewish people, the celebration of God's deliverance from their slavery in Egypt. Right? If you go back to the book of Exodus, you will read about the original Passover. The, the Hebrew people, the ancient Israelites, were in slavery in Egypt, and they cried out to God. God heard their cry, and he delivered them through the ten plagues, right? And the final plague was the angel of death. It was going to strike down the firstborn in all of Egypt. And what God told the Israelites to do on that night was to slaughter a lamb, to sacrifice a lamb, take the blood of that lamb and paint it on their doorposts so that when the angel came by, he would pass over and spare the Israelites the death of their firstborn. And that's exactly what happened. And so from then on, God commanded them, celebrate this Passover meal every year as a way of remembering the way that I saved you from slavery in Egypt and as a way of teaching the next generation who wasn't alive at the time or who won't remember what I did for their ancestors. So that's what the Passover is. It's the meal of God's deliverance, his greatest act of salvation, the Exodus, saving his people from slavery in Egypt. And that is the meal that Jesus shared with his apostles. He'd shared one or two others in the previous two years. But this Passover was different. Because in the hours before his death, as he celebrated the Passover with them, celebrating God's deliverance and God's salvation, Jesus said and did a couple of things that redefined the Passover and reinterpreted the Passover so that it no longer just applied to what God had done in the Exodus, but that it applied to what God was about to do and for us has done in Jesus Christ. The first thing that Jesus said is kind of subtle and it's easy to miss. Jesus told his apostles, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you. Now, in the original Greek that that was written in, there's a play on words there. If you were to, to translate the words Passover and supper and, and go back to the Greek, they sound almost identical. It would sound something like, I have earnestly desired to eat this Pascha with you before I Pasco. Pascha, Pasco. And so Jesus has these two Greek words in mind, and he deliberately puts them together as a way of paralleling the original meaning of the Passover with what he is about to do. It's his way of prefacing the rest of the dinner for the disciples and saying that the Passover and the meaning you think it has is about to change, and it has everything to do with the suffering I am about to undergo. So that's the first thing Jesus says to reinterpret the meaning of the Passover and sort of aim it in the direction of himself and what he is about to do. The next thing that Jesus does and says is he reinterprets the meaning of the food itself at the meal. Now, the Passover meal, and this is true still today, or if some of you have been part of a Seder dinner, uh, maybe during Holy Week or something like that, it's basically the same thing. The, the various elements of the meal, the, the, the actual food and drink of the meal, each element has a specific meaning that is interpreted and that is talked about during the meal to remind people of what God did on the original Passover when he delivered the Israelites from Egypt. So, for example, the unleavened bread, right? That's the thing we probably are most familiar with. In the original Passover, God told the Israelites, you need to be ready to get up and go in a hurry so when you bake some bread for yourselves, don't even bother to put in the yeast. Don't put in the leaven. It's going to be flat, hard bread because you just need it to survive. You need to be ready to go quickly when Pharaoh is ready to let you go. So don't put leaven in your bread. And so still today, the Passover meal has unleavened bread because it has that meaning that goes back to what originally happened. And each of the elements of the meal are the same way. Well, what Jesus did in this dinner with his disciples 
is he took two of the elements in particular and infused them with new meaning. First of all, the bread. And now we're getting into the language that we're used to when we celebrate communion. Jesus said, this bread is my body. In other words, no longer is this just a reminder of the fact that your ancestors had to leave in a hurry. This bread now refers to my body, which is broken for you or given for you. Do this in remembrance, not just of your ancestors, but of me. And then it says in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Again, do this in remembrance of me. And so Jesus takes the meal itself and says, yes, this is still a meal of God's salvation and God's deliverance, but now you find that salvation and that deliverance in me. The Exodus had been God's greatest act of salvation ever, but now something greater was about to happen. And so Jesus effectively replaces the Exodus as God's defining act of salvation throughout all human history. And it's even greater because it's not just for the Israelites or for one group or one ethnicity. Jesus gains salvation for everyone who will put their trust in him, from every tribe, every nation, every language, everyone who comes to him, Jew and Gentile, whatever the case may be, you come to Jesus, you've got salvation in him. And so it's even greater than anybody was prepared to imagine, far greater than the Exodus. And Jesus says, this meal is now about me because I am the agent of God's salvation for you and for everyone. And so what the Passover was and still is today for the Jewish people, the Lord's Supper, as we call it, now is for the church. It's the same meal, but it's been reinterpreted by Jesus, and that's why we call it the Lord's Supper, because it's all about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the meal of the church. It's the meal of God's people. The Lord's Supper is to us what the Passover had been and still is today for the Jewish people. Now, When we partake of this meal, I know there's not communion today. The the calendar just didn't work out the way I wanted it to. We celebrate on the first Sunday of the month, but the supper really is the first in the series of events of the Passion, so I needed to preach on it today. But when we do celebrate the Lord's Supper together, not only does it create community and strengthen relationships, as all meals do, it creates a certain kind of relationship and a certain kind of community. Again, as all meals do. One of the fastest ways you can get to know a new culture when you travel to a different country or even just a different part of this country is to sit down and eat a meal with people, right? That's where you see the habits and the cultural norms really come out. I remember a number of years ago, I think it was 2011, Melody and I went to Morocco with a group from our seminary. And the the fastest way we could learn about Moroccan culture was to sit down around a table and eat with the Moroccan people. And we learned about a certain way that they wash their hands before meals. And we learned about how, you know, basically everybody reaches their hands in and grabs food from the same dish. They have something called a tagine. It's basically a cone-shaped crock pot. And all the food is on there and everybody just reaches in and grabs it. And there's a certain etiquette that, that we found strange, but they found normal. But when we ate together, that was the quickest way to see the kind of community that we were in. Because that's also what meals do. They create a certain kind of community. And this meal, the Lord's Supper, when we partake of this meal together, it forms us into a certain kind of community. And in this scripture, this passage, when Jesus had the supper with his disciples, there are at least two things that stand out about the kind of community it shapes us into. The first thing that stands out is that this meal shapes us into a community of kingdom seekers. We are people who are kingdom seekers. And the second thing that stands out is that we are a community that is enemy friendly. Enemy friendly. Back to the kingdom. Twice in this passage, Jesus said, I will not eat this or drink this again 
until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. In other words, this is a kingdom meal, or this looks forward to the kingdom of God when Jesus comes again in all of his glory and he's done putting all of his enemies under his feet and he is our king over God's kingdom and he alone reigns with no rival, with no competition. That day when the kingdom of God fully comes, that's what this meal anticipates and looks forward to. And so that tells us that that's who we are. We dinner together at this family table, we are kingdom people. It's a way of reminding us that Jesus is our king, and we trust in him not just for some spiritual salvation, but we put our allegiance in him as our king so that we will one day partake of his kingdom together. This dinner is a kind of pledge of allegiance to Jesus as our king and the one that we trust with our lives and for our salvation. We are kingdom people. And that's marked by certain characteristics that Jesus taught us. We are a forgiving people. Remember Jesus said forgive not just seven times, but 70 times seven. That's who we are as kingdom people. We forgive. We love even our enemies as ourselves. And I'll come back to that in a moment. We, we don't worry about tomorrow and, and our own possessions and our own success. We, we care more for our neighbors than we do even about our own lives at times. This is what Jesus calls us to, right? We are kingdom people. We live as citizens of that kingdom according to its laws and its values. That's what it means to be kingdom seekers, and that's what this meal forms us into. We are kingdom seekers. The other aspect of this meal and the kind of community it forms us into is really fascinating. I'm sure you didn't miss the fact that Jesus, after he talked about the bread and the cup, he said, but... The hand of the one who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The hand of the one who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. Jesus knew that his betrayer was sharing this intimate and special Passover meal with him and with the rest of the disciples, and Jesus allowed him to stay. He didn't say, I know what you're going to do. Get out. You don't belong here. He also didn't let him off the hook. He said, look, the Son of Man has to go according to the plan, basically. I have to go and suffer, but woe to the one who betrays the Son of Man. So Judas doesn't get off the hook. There are still consequences, probably eternal consequences, for what he has done. But Jesus says his hand is with mine on the table, and Jesus doesn't kick him out. And I think there are profound implications for us as kingdom seekers, as the people who follow Jesus to follow his example. We are enemy friendly. No, this doesn't mean we're doormats. It doesn't mean there's never a time to defend ourselves against very real enemies who would do us and our families harm. But again, in the meal, they sit at table with the one that's going to betray Jesus. They sit with their enemy They don't know who it is yet, but Jesus does, and they allow him to stay. We are enemy friendly. They don't get off the hook, but we love our enemies. Jesus said, love your enemies. He said, anybody can love their friends, but what makes you different, what makes this community unique is the fact that you're willing to sit down and eat even with your enemy. Like Psalm 23, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy hard teaching, but it is a part of who we are. And when we partake of this meal, it forms us into kingdom seekers who are enemy friendly. That's what this meal does. It forms us into a certain kind of people. It's where we learn what it means to be a part of this family. Just like at your own dinner tables growing up as kids, right? That's where you learn how to be a part of this family. You don't behave at the table. Your mom or your dad's going to say, we don't do that in this family, right? Here's what we do in this family. Here's what we don't do in this family. Here's what this family is about. This is where we learn how to be a part of God's own family. Now, really quickly, you may have noticed that the title of this sermon is simply The Supper. It's not The Last Supper, even though in your Bibles it'll probably have that phrase at the top of the section. We often call this The Last Supper, but I haven't called it that because it's not The Last Supper. It's the last one Jesus had before he went to the cross, 
but it's not the Last Supper. Again, Jesus said, I won't partake of this until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. There is another meal coming. There's another supper with our Savior that is coming when his kingdom arrives. In fact, that's the way the Bible describes heaven and the kingdom of God, going all the way back to Isaiah and then in the New Testament as well. It talks about a feast, a joyful feast in the kingdom of God. In fact, in Luke's gospel earlier, Jesus himself said that on that day, people will come from east and west and north and south, and they will take their seat at the joyful feast in the kingdom of God. This is not the Last Supper. It is a foretaste of the Last Supper. It gets us ready for that Last Supper, but that final supper is still coming. And when we partake of this meal, it connects us to that Last Supper. It's a way of participating in the kingdom of God itself. That's why we call it communion. The word communion means to participate in something. And it's not just a metaphor. It's not just a symbol. We are truly participating in that last feast on the day when Jesus comes. It's, I, I always compare this to when you go to Costco, right? You go to Costco on a Saturday and you're looking for a cheap lunch so you, you get all the samples that you can, and then you go back around and you do it again or you have your spouse get them again, right? You get all the samples of this delicious food. Now, is the sample fake? No. It's real. It's the real thing, even though the full product is still sitting there on the shelf waiting for you to buy, but the sample is the real thing. You are tasting the real thing and participating in that food in a real way. And in a mysterious but still real way, it's the same for us. When we partake of the Lord's Supper together, we are partaking of the real thing, the kingdom feast on that day when Jesus arrives. And we all partake of it together. This is what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples, and they wouldn't understand it until later. And it's what he's trying to teach us and what he does teach us through the supper together. And I don't know about you, but what a marvelous thing to be part of. What a wonderful family to be included in. I am honored to share on occasion this meal with you, to share God's mission with you, to share in his family with you, all because of what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has done for us. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.